Hello, Satanico here, and it's finally time to get around to my free comic book day video. Um, I actually did do one uh, just a few days after free comic book day. I wasn't too happy with it and ultimately decided not to upload it and decided to try my hand at a new one. So we're going to give it another shot here. Um, now the comics aren't quite as new to me as they were when I first um, did the first video, but they're still, I'm still pretty excited about them. I haven't really looked through them very much, so let's give it a shot. First comic, by the way, um, this is Thor 341, and it is Walt Simonson art, and what I was going to say is that um, <clears throat> I, I got mostly Bronze Age comics from the dollar bin uh, on Free Comic Book Day. Um, that's when they had the special, and so I tried to pick up as many Bronze Age comics as I could for a dollar. I picked up about 30, probably 25 are Bronze Age, and the rest are um, a little bit more modern, and then uh, I got a couple of other things too, so we'll just go through all of them. Probably about 36 or 30, yeah, 36 or 37 comics total. <clears throat> so that's Thor 341, uh, beautiful Walt Simonson cover. Uh, that's why I got it. Um, I have Walt Simonson in several of his Thors in my collection, but uh, far, far from being complete. I was almost done with comics at the time that these came out and uh, but you can see really <laughs> uh, interesting art and um, he just kind of had a free hand to do whatever he wanted to with Thor and he really took the title to new heights that hadn't been reached really even though they had, had many very good artists like Keith Pollard obviously John Bashima is a master but Thor had been a little bit dormant or a little bit overlooked, you know, since obviously the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee era. This next one is X Factor number 41. And as you can see, beautiful cover. There's a reason why I get this as well, Arthur Adams. And Arthur Adams is probably one of the preeminent Bronze Age comic artists. You can see once again, Great art, very detailed, very detailed characters. Um, beautiful interiors. Uh, in this one, he is inked by Alan Milgram. It was actually written by Louise Simonson, who was Walt's wife, uh, which is also pretty interesting. But and Walt Simonson, of course, did some quite a few uh, books on X Factor. So, but I'm not sure. I don't remember if he actually uh, worked with Louise writing the scripts or not. But absolutely, for a dollar, we'll get that. Next up, Starfire: Tales of the Teen Titans. That's number four. I have number one and I think three, which are Cyborg and Chameleon Boy or Changeling. And uh, so I picked that up, obviously, for great George Perez art. Um, I believe Romeo Tengal is the anchor. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This one was inked by Ernie Colon. And actually, uh, there are different anchors on this series because uh, I believe Changeling is inked by Gene Day, who was a fantastic artist who died far too young. And uh, as you can see, once again, really nice artwork from George Perez. So that's certainly a great dollar pickup. Next is King Conan. I'm sorry, Conan the King. Um, I had seen this cover in some of my other Bronze Age comics when I was doing some scans over the past few months and I saw a full page ad for this cover which I thought was a beautiful cover I was a little bit surprised that this book wasn't more 
well known, more successful. Uh, Conan always sort sort of flies under the radar, appeals to a certain audience apparently, and um, but always has stellar artists. John Bashima, of course, being you know one of the stalwarts along with Ernie Chan. Uh, who inked a lot of them and, and drew some as well. And, of course, Barry Windsor Smith had the fantastic run. This is Mike Kaluta's cover, um, which probably explains why it's such a nice cover. But interestingly, inside, um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's Mark Silvestri and looks like Severin. So that would be John Severin. One of the greats, I think, was worked at EC, obviously, as a uh, younger sister Marie Severin also worked at Marvel. Um, she was a she was a fine artist, but uh, they primarily gave her a coloring job. But not what you would expect from Mark Silvestri. His style has changed changed quite a lot from them. But you see a very conventional sort of approach and really nice and inked by John Severin, one of the masters, who did a lot of uh, war books as well. From, uh, uh, this is Marvel 2 and 1, 57. Marvel 2 and 1 and Marvel Team Up are uh, two of the most fun series, particularly up until about the 50s, 60s, 70s. That's about as long as I was reading them. Um, <clears throat> and this one, again... First of all, the thing, Wondar was a very interesting character. <laughs> um, and this is a George Perez and Alan Milgram, who appears all over Marvel Comics cover. And then inside we get um, George Perez and Gene Day. I just mentioned Gene Day. Fantastic inker, fantastic penciler for Marvel, best known for probably for Master of Kung Fu. Also did some two and ones, I believe some team ups. Did a lot of different things, um, and uh, as you can see, really nice artwork inside. And so, it's just a fun comic, and in decent condition. You can see a little bit of, of color, discoloration there. Drop to my glasses. Next up. X Factor 42, and again, I'm fairly certain I picked this up because it's Arthur Adams. And actually, oops, sorry. So it looks like, oh yes, it's Arthur Adams' cover as well. And then you can see inside, there it is, Arthur Adams, Alan Milgram, once again. Beautiful detail. Um, it's not just the detail. Um, Arthur Adams had tremendous influence on the image artist, unfortunately, uh, particularly Rob Liefeld, Todd McFarlane. Todd McFarlane did it quite well. Rob Liefeld um, went for the most superficial aspects of Arthur Adams' work uh, with all of the stress lines. And um, in Adams, as you can see, um, if you can see some of all of the detail that he's drawn onto these dinosaurs, this Tyrannosaurus rex, um, there's information in the texture of the skin, the sort of armor of the skin. It's not just uh, superfluous doodling. It's not uh, this just insane amount of pointless detail and stress lines that Rob Liefeld uh, latched onto and kind of made into sort of a garish sort of spectacle that uh, defined 90s mainstream art. So you can't blame Arthur Adams for who he influenced, but you can see that his work was absolutely stellar, and still is, and obviously I would buy that for a dollar all day. And quite a few floors in this collection uh, or in this little selection that I picked up. Um, that's 342. I believe we just saw 341. Um, you can see Simonson's classic signature at the bottom. Great cover. And I know that I was quite surprised that one of these I thought was absolutely Walter Simonson. And in fact, it was drawn by Sal Bashima, who is usually known for being pretty much pretty staid in his approach 
Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we come across it. This is inked by Terry Austin, who was best known for inking John Byrne on the Uncanny X-Men. And so you can count on fantastic inking. This is number 347, more Walt Simonson. As you can see inside. And actually Simonson, this is Simonson penciling and inking his work. So, and he really started to feel his oats and get more and more extreme at times with some of his character designs, obviously Beta Ray Bill being the classic and essentially making Thor into a giant frog. Um, but again, really nice art. This is 347. This is 348. And this is Simonson inked by Bob Wyacek, another stalwart at Marvel who did a lot of inking work and I think occasionally some pencils, but Bob Wyacek primarily known as an inker. And now this is an interesting one, Dr. Zero. And I'm sure I was captivated by the cover, painted cover, and it certainly looked like Bill Sinkovich to me. And fairly certain that it is. And when I looked inside, I was a little bit surprised. I don't know if you can read that there, but um, it was drawn by Denise Cowan, the penciler, and inked by Sinkovich, uh, written by D.G. Chichester and Margaret Clark. <clears throat> so Denise Cowan uh, did the question, and um, I think he was actually a black belt in martial arts, so he sometimes did some of um, Marvel's uh, and maybe DC's martial artist martial arts uh, books, and um, I believe he did. Uh, hmm. Well, I, I know he drew some Batman. He drew some various things, but uh, this definitely looks a lot like Sinkovich's style. So I think uh, Cowan certainly did some loose pencils, and Sinkovich did some pretty heavy in inking. And um, you can see really nice artwork. Um, obviously, I'll buy things with Bill Sinkovich. And it's Dr. Zero. It's for Epic Comics, 1988. So it's a little bit at the very end, of, the, or maybe a little bit after the Bronze Age, but pretty close. And here we go again with another interesting title from Epic Comics. These are two titles I never remember seeing. Um, <clears throat> but this is called St. George. It's the final issue. I had never heard of it before. I thought it was a little pretty interesting cover. And I just decided to peek inside, and I was very pleasantly pleasantly surprised once again. If you can see that name right there, Jim Lee, artist, pencils and inks written by Dwayne McDuffie. Um, so that's a very early Jim Lee book. This is 1989, and so I'll certainly purchase that. Really nice artwork and uh, maybe not quite as polished as you expect Jim Lee. Certainly latter stage, uh, certainly by the time he got to the X-Men and if you look at his current work now, which is almost always inked the same, by the same guy. But uh, really, really cool artwork. Really, really interesting and interesting series. This is the final issue. I think I came across a couple of more, but the others were not drawn by Jim Lee, so I don't think I bought them. Um, but that's a nice surprise to get a Jim Lee book for a dollar that I hadn't, that I wasn't even aware of. Another Dr. Zero. I think I bought all four of these. This is Dr. Zero number two. Again, Denise Cowan and Bill Sinkovich. And you can see very interesting artwork, fascinating layouts, and a great title as well, The Judas Goat. How can you go wrong for a dollar? And all of these are in nice shape. I would say very good to find. 
And this is Dr. Zira number three. Again, really interesting cover. Again, really beautiful artwork inside. I actually really like this artwork. Um, Denise Cowan didn't always have a style that I loved, but he matches up extremely well with Bill Sinkovich. Um, Sinkovich, of course, is a fantastic pink, penciler, painter, but also did a lot of inking work, including on Daredevil for Marvel and um, and on Batman as well for DC. Um, it's kind of like having uh, Michelangelo inking your work. It's one of the modern masters. And Dr. Zero number four, that's the last one. Proletariat, sort of a uh, Russian propaganda cover. I have no idea what this series is about, by the way. I really bought it for the art. But it actually looks quite interesting. Um, I believe D.G. Chichester, is he a novelist? or I've certainly seen his name before. Perhaps he writes other DC stuff as well. Um, but I don't recall reading much of his work, if any. <clears throat> but this is a very interesting series. It's certainly worth giving a look. And it's really unfortunate in a way that um, Epic didn't do a better job of promoting these. I have the Epic uh, magazines several of those that kind of mimicked uh, Heavy Metal magazine, um, which ultimately I didn't like so much, uh, the Epic or Heavy Metal. I mean, like all anthologies, they were very inconsistent. Uh, which reminds me, one of these comics had, that's went right to the right one. The first one had a really beautiful Mobius advertisement. Epic Comics proudly presents a new work by the most acclaimed graphic artists in the world, Mobius, um, Jean Giraud, and uh, the Gardens of Idina. And unfortunately, Jean Giraud, Mobius died um, a few years ago, three, four years ago, maybe longer. Um, it was uh, quite a sad blow because he was still relatively young. I think he was in his 60s, maybe 70s. I believe in his, still in his late 60s, and so tremendous loss because an absolute genius. <clears throat> That's Thor 367. Again, Walt Simonson. Simonson, Simonson. And yes, uh, writing and penciling, inked this time by Wycheck, Milgram, and Simonson. So a little bit of everybody from that we've seen in the previous issues. Nice bright white paper, and um, as usual, fascinating artwork on almost every page. <clears throat> and a really nice copy, a little soiling, tiny bit, white paper, white cover. Uh, Thor 361. Thor 363, and this is the one that kind of fooled me. That is definitely... A Walt Simonson cover right there. I saw that some of these during this run had been drawn by Sabashima. Sabashima drew seemingly hundreds, maybe thousands, probably thousands of Marvel comics and um, over the years, uh, as well as his older brother, John Bashima. John Bashima, I think, was far and away the more talented and the more established of the two. Sal was a utilitarian you know, artist, he just got, got the job done. He was probably capable of doing far better, um, but he told the story, and I, he told a lot of, he illustrated a lot of comics that I really loved when I was a kid, um, but he had a certain telltale style, and he wasn't spectacular by any stretch of the imagination, so I probably wouldn't have bought this knowing it was Sabashima, but, um, okay, well, this one isn't so I fooled myself, but one of these is. Uh, this one is actually off Simonson. Okay, I think this character appears on the other one. By, and this issue is actually pretty. It looks all right on camera, perhaps. I don't know if you can tell. I don't think you can see because I can't see it looking on camera. But it's all a little bit bent up on the cover. It's a little beat up. I don't care. I bought it primarily for the art, and it's got really nice art in it. Um, and this Guinness Simonson, of course, 
the 351. Yeah, this is still when he was doing all of the pencils and inks himself, so, you know, and really fantastic vision of Asgard. Uh, Beta Ray Bill appears. Really interesting stories. And great comic to be purchased for a dollar, and that one's actually in nice shape. Some more Thor's coming, but back to Conan the King, and that is another Michael Kaluta cover, I'm fairly certain. Oh yes, there's his signature down there. It's a little bit small, so you probably cannot see it. <clears throat> and the art is again by Silvestri and Isherwood. That would be Mark Silvestri and Jeff Isherwood, who actually did a giant... Marvel graphic novel on the Avengers with the uh, living monolith. I have that issue from the 80s, I do believe. And again, really nice artwork. And actually, this looks very much like John Bashima's work. This is Silvestri sort of channeling John Bashima, who was kind of the master on Conan. Um, couldn't learn from a better artist than John Bashima, so. Uh, you get to see that Mark Silvestri certainly had the fundamentals down if he can emulate John Bashima and very effectively. Okay, this is <laughs> Conan number 11 from the original series. And as you can see, it is beat to pieces. It's got major tear there. A lot of scuffing at the bottom. A lot of damage around here. Obviously this tear is the key thing and a lot of damage along the spine. Why did I buy it you ask? Well one it's for a dollar. Two it's Barry Windsor Smith. Classic Barry Windsor Smith and I'm surprised these books were pretty thick for you know a standard comic. It almost feels like a an annual, a later annual. It's got a nasty watermark there as well. Almost looks like coffee but but Inside pages are very nice, and you can see Barry Windsor Smith's sort of beautiful drawing already. He was probably not a fully formed artist when he came onto Conan. I think Roy Thomas, the writer, said they sort of came into his own and became sort of the legendary artist of Bronze Age, one of them. But the artwork in this is still really beautiful. Um, beautiful ringlets in her hair. And absolutely worth it for me for a dollar. You see there, big letter, Stanley editor, Roy Thomas, writer, Barry Windsor Smith artist. And number 11. And when the guy was, actually, they were standing outside and um, they had the boxes, they had several tables set up and the boxes, rows of boxes for a dollar comics outside and then you would just pick out your comics. They would tally them at the door. Then you could go in the store and shop, get your free comics and shop for higher end back issues or new comics or whatever. And um, they gave you a little uh, voucher or whatever saying that you had 30 comics and you just presented that to the cashier but the guy who was counting my comics was when he came across this one he was like wow this one is in really bad shape and I said yes indeed but uh, it's, I, didn't, I didn't even uh, see the comic you know he just had them in a stack but I knew exactly which one he was talking about I said it was Barry Windsor Smith so it's certainly worth for me so I only have, I think, one other Conan. And it's not in great shape either. It's certainly in better shape than that one. And it's Conan the King again. And this is Michael Kaluta again with a added special guest of Charles Vess. If you can see his signature there. Um, a really nice pairing. Not one that you see too often. But when you think of Kaluta sort of, they, and Vess, they both have very light sort of delicate lines. Um, and they surprisingly complement each other beautifully. So that turned out to be a really nice cover. Interior art is Simons in Isherwood. And 
I believe that's Dave Simons. He tends to do things, you know, that look like this with a lot of shading and sort of dark shadowing on um, all of his artwork. It's actually quite nice, though. He's actually a very skilled artist as well. I know him best from doing a few what ifs. Um, he's certainly done other stuff, but um, he didn't seem to appear in too many comic books for whatever reason. But he's a very talented artist. Yeah, yep. Oh, okay. There's a backup story. Or maybe that's the maybe that's the original credits. And you see Alan Zelenitz, Dave Simons, and Jeff Isherwood, so But again, beautiful cover. And that is Thor three fifty four with Gila. Goddess of Death, I do believe. Stand aside, Thor, for I am Death, and Odin's soul is mine. She is appearing in the new Thor movie, I think, which actually looks entertaining. And, of course, more Walt Simonson art. It's kind of a Walt Simonson showcase, because I just came across a bunch of Thors for a dollar with his artwork. Uh, no one would have ever imagined that Rocket Raccoon, I certainly would not have, would become a breakout star at Marvel. That's what the movies are doing for these characters. Because he was not a breakout star in comics. But the movies are now driving the comics, regardless of what people think. <clears throat> um, and this is Walt Simonson as well. Beta Ray Bill. Got a little crease in the back that I could feel. And I keep looking for the one that tripped me up that was actually Sabashima. I should be able to tell as soon as I open it. I mean, Sabashima has a very specific style. But uh, the, that one kind of tripped me up also, not only because I believe it had a Simonson cover, but because um, Sabashima um, drew quite a bit like Walt Simonson, or at least the character designs were by Simonson. So it was one of the more iconoclastic I would say Bishima works which was a good thing okay not one of the better covers so it's an it's a nice cover it's interesting but it's not you know doesn't really blow your mind and similarly this one as well but there's a beta rig build cover number 358 <clears throat> Still art by Summonson. Penciling and inking his work. Some really interesting page layouts with these long horizontal panels. All right. And Okay, maybe that's that one. 368. We shall see. Still has a Simonson cover. Yes, finally. And I thought it was the other one because of this character right here. He was on the cover of the previous one, but he's on the interior of this one. This is a really nice copy, actually. It's in very good shape. Probably very fine at the very least. And it is written by Walt Simonson, penciled and inked by Salvashima. That's another unique thing about this, is that Salvashima rarely inked his own work. He was a guy who you get the impression was just trying to crank out comics as fast as he possibly could and make a living. Um, and usually went about them very quickly. But while these faces, these facial classic sort of gaping mouth, that is a sign of Sal Bishima, um, the character designs are Simonson's and it almost looks as if Simonson almost laid this out for Salbashima and Salbashima finished it. It's definitely some of Salbashima's best work. Perhaps if he had penciled and inked his own work more often, it would have looked this finished, this polished. Instead, a lot of times it looked um, not so much unfinished, but uh, very, as I said, utilitarian. And um, that's sort of a classic 
again, Bashima gaping mouth, and he did facial expressions to look the same almost page to page. Um, and he's certainly varied that up here. So nice work by Sal Bashima. And this is interesting. Mystery in Space, number one by Graham Morrison. Um, I was a little confused as to why I get this. I, I mean, I knew I had a reason, but I'm not a huge Mystery in Space fan. This is obviously a reboot, and this is from what year? Um, but we'll find out as I open it that, I mean, it's a relatively new comic. But the reason why is because it's J.H. Williams. J.H. Williams, uh, frequent collaborator with Alan Moore on America's Best Comics, probably best known for his beautiful work on Promethea, but has done a lot of other stuff, and that's exactly why I got it. J.H. Williams is a very talented artist, and uh, if I can get past some of these ads, you might get to see it. Um, unfortunately, okay, well, get a few glimpses of it, but there are a lot of ads. And then there has a backup story here by Jerry Ordway, who's also a quality artist, and it's written by Grant Morrison. Jerry Ordway, more often than not, is an inker, best known probably for inking John Byrne on Superman. But that's why I get that. A nice cover as well. And this is Blade of the Immortal, number 112. Blade of the Immortal uh, has a long-running... Um, manga series by Hiroki Samura, reprinted or printed by, you know, in, in the United States by Dark Horse, and all the way up to number 112. I have an earlier issue, um, and this apparently is a series arc called On the Perfection of Anatomy, number one of six, and beautiful covers, wraparound cover, <clears throat> black and white interiors and he's just a exceptional artist and uh, working I think at pretty good speed you will not find too many artists Dave Sims being one of them uh, perhaps obviously their brother Hernandez artists who tend to have their own thing may work this long but you don't find very many American artists, certainly not in the mainstream, who've done 112 issues of their own comic. There are the rare exceptions. As I said, Dave Sim, who I believe did 300 issues of Cerebus, but they are rare exceptions. And this is basically a how-to on drawing from Hiroki Samura, very skilled artist who draws... He draws with detail, but some of it has a minimalistic, you know, style as well. Another beautiful cover. Picked this one up as well. In fact, it was so windy that day, and as I said, we were outside. I had a stack of comics, and I actually had my phone. I, uh, I had to put my phone on top of the stack of comics. It was so windy. This comic, this issue, just blew right off the stack onto the ground, onto the asphalt, at the feet of someone who was walking around um, and she picked it up and handed it back to me didn't take any damage not wouldn't have mattered particularly because again a dollar comic I'm not expecting these to be worth anything uh, I bought these because of the art and because I'm just happy to have them in my collection you can see again beautifully drawn um, and Certainly not for children. These are not, you know, as you can see. Um, that's 130. This is 112. <laughs> this is number three of four of an arc called the Badger Hole. So. And here is a modern comic. Kind of shocking. They actually bought one modern comic. Or, you know, right up to date is JLA. And it's by Brian Hitch, who I think is a good artist, and so that's why I like this cover. A lot of detail. Sort of an old, almost George Perez with so many characters on it. And then mostly background, these figures that are dead or, or comatose. And I believe I bought this 
because of Brian Hitch's artwork. I, I believe um, I'm vaguely familiar with his artwork, and it's nice work. Alex Sinclair, excellent colorist. Um, and simply because it's a good deal. <laughs> it's a $4 comic. It's brand new, I believe. Um, probably published in 2016 or 2017. They're not as obvious about those things these days. It doesn't say. But, um, <clears throat> and it's a $4 comic. $4. Brand new. Um, so, and by an artist I like. If they had had a lot of $4 modern comics, uh, uh, by artists that I, care nothing about I probably still wouldn't have bought them but um, I'm as I said I'm a little bit familiar with Brian Hitch I believe he did the um, the authority with um, what's that Mark Millar so anyway and then last well last of the dollar comics and supposedly there I got 30 so there should be 29 here I wasn't counting the last of the dollar comics I've actually bagged this one I'll take it out of the bag I was caught by surprise with this one, happily. Um, X-Factor, and again, Walt Simonson art. That's why I bought it. But what I wasn't aware at the time, even when I bought it, was um, I just saw the Walt Simonson. I saw X-Factor. Um, I flipped it open. I saw Simonson's art. But what caught me by surprise was, if you can see through the glare, See that signature? Silver pin signature from Walt Simons himself with a classic, I believe the first O goes super large. And what a nice surprise. Uh, not a big deal. Well, I was, I was excited uh, to see that it was uh, signed because uh, he has a really cool signature. Obviously, I like his art. I bought numerous stores because of it, and I'm fairly certain that that one just slipped into the pile. I'm not saying it's worth a, a great deal while Simonson's alive and well. It probably attends a lot of comics conventions and probably signs a hell of a lot of comics. So it's not a rare signature by any stretch of the imagination. But still, um, the comic itself is in really nice shape. It's beautiful artwork, it's Fall of the Mutants, X-Factor, so it's certainly worth more than a dollar, as is. And then with his signature, you know, what, five dollars at least, maybe ten, maybe fifteen. Not that I'm, I'm not, I didn't buy it intending to sell it. I didn't even buy it knowing that it was signed. I didn't even recognize the signature, which I'm sure is exactly what was the case with, uh, the, um, with my, uh, local comic shop, because, um, I'm sure they wouldn't have put a signed book, a signed X Factor book in there by such a renowned artist for a buck. I'm sure they would have at least tried to get five or ten bucks out of it. So I was very happy with that. It's a really nice signature. And um, so I bagged and boarded it, of course, because felt like it had some value. Okay, this is Marvel Fanfare number two. That is Michael Golden. I'm a big fan of Michael Golden's art. Um, I was back in the Bronze Age in the 80s, and still am, and, and obviously he became pretty popular, uh, but one of those guys who is probably his most famous from was on Micronauts, of all things, um, unfortunately, and he kind of just did sporadic work after that, and this is Marvel Fanfare number one. Now, also by Michael Golden. Now I have both of these, and I actually have both of them signed, which is unusual because I have very few comics signed. Um, but I went to a, I went to Heroes Con in Charlotte, probably in 1997, and got um, Michael Golden and Paul Smith to sign these issues. And Paul Smith actually did a really nice little drawing of a pterodactyl on the, on the front. He was a super nice guy about it. And so I have those signed. Um, these were half price. They were 50% off. So they're each labeled at $5. So I pay $5 for both of them. I figure I'd probably just flip them and resell them or trade them to someone, someone wanted them for something that I wanted. 
So I felt like it was a good deal. And I like those issues particularly. I love the artwork. Um, so there you go. And then I bought a couple more from the Ben. These were, I believe, uh, 25% off. So I think I got this for 3 bucks. It's a, It was listed at 4 That's a John Byrne um, cover and artwork in inside. Really nice artwork inside. I didn't really notice, so I got it probably... Um, I didn't notice that this one was pretty beat up. It's John Byrne and Joseph Rubenstein. Uh, it's got some real weird sort of damage along this edge. And I can't even determine what that is. Um, it's not water damage. It almost looks like heat. And maybe it is water, actually. And maybe somebody tried to wipe it down or something. But, uh, yeah, so. But it's still fine. It's not in great shape, but um, the cover still pops off pretty nicely um it's got a little it's also got a little oh uh, maybe not maybe that was on the outside and then i bought another one this was also john byrne um marvel team up with red sonya uh again three dollars i think absolutely worth it great comic um great artwork inside and they had a little note on here mj is red sonya so i guess that's supposed to be mary jane as Red Sonja, which is kind of interesting. Um, as I said, Marvel 2 and 1 and Marvel Team Ups were probably, in retrospect, some of the most fun comics that they made in the 1980s and the Bronze Age, maybe Marvel ever made. Um, they were consistently very fun and uh, very well written, and certainly when they had artists like George Perez or John Byrne, um, extremely well drawn. And so, always uh, still love those comics. So I picked up two. Um, I picked up two free comics. Uh, my store was pretty tight-fisted, I guess, about this. Whereas, if if you were apparently a subscriber, you you know, to the store and had a regular pull list, which I don't buy new comics, and I, I this in fact was my first free comic day ever. Um, I've heard of it, I've seen it online, I've never actually attended, uh, and it was fun, it was nice, um, I enjoyed I enjoyed looking through the dollar boxes, and I would definitely do it again, but um, they were giving subscribers four comics, um, and everybody else two comics, I was always under the impression that you got free comics, all of the free comics from... And I've seen other people who received them all free, but uh, apparently it depends on the store, and they have to pay a little bit of percentage, and or maybe even the postage on these. And so, um, so I can understand to a degree. Um, uh, there was nothing that I was dying to have, but there was. Um, it's nice to be able to just pick up something random, and be maybe captivated by it, or discover a new artist. Or new series. That's like exactly where the purpose of Free Comic Book Day is, is to bring people in. And obviously, um, the publishers are putting out these free comics uh, in the hopes of getting you hooked into one of their series. Maybe an established series. Maybe, you know, something being relaunched. Or maybe something entirely new. Maybe new creators. So, um, but uh, of what they had... Um, they didn't have, they had pretty much everything was available, but uh, there were a couple that were missing. Um, so I just got a pretty standard um, that I see a lot of people got. This was Secret Empire um, by Andrea Sorrentino, art by Andrea Sorrentino and written by Nick Spencer. I'm, I have no idea what's really in this, but I, I did notice this. Um, looking inside, I really like this artwork. I was impressed by the artwork. It wasn't wasn't sort of garish, overcolored stuff, um, over photoshopped. Uh, this was very much like J. Lee artwork to me, with the way it's inked. It reminded me quite a lot of his artwork, which I quite like. So I was impressed by this. Um, nice artwork. Um, I haven't read it. But then you see, sort of gets to this. Um, which is drawn, it was written by Chip Zdarsky and drawn by Paolo Sikora, 
and this is kind of this is kind of the modern. This reminds me a little bit of Marvel or mainstream of the '90s, which I didn't read. I was out of comics at the time, but I've seen enough of it to know. Um, and uh, I would not probably buy a comic that had art like this. There's nothing. It's certainly accomplished. It's certainly very competent. Um, but it just doesn't. It just doesn't feel very organic to me. It feels very computer generated, and uh, some of it's okay, but um, have a lot less interest. But that page is alright, and this is uh, an advertisement for Thor with Oliver Coipel, Jason Aaron. I quite like his art as well. Um, so, um, I guess Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man, launches. And the artworks by Adam Kubert, so it will be a bit different. And then I think everyone got this issue as well. Wonder Woman. Um, again, really beautiful cover. Um, and it's written by Greg Rucka. Interior art is not as impressive. Again, it's kind of that modern style, like very um, almost computer generated. <laughs> or computer. All of them are computer colored, of course, but sometimes they go overboard with the effects. But then you see a page like that is quite nice. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nicely drawn. Obviously, there's a big push behind Wonder Woman now because that's DC's next flagship movie. Comics have given way to movies. And finally, I got something that ultimately I probably regret getting. Um, I was looking and I saw some of the new Batman issues. I was just looking through them to see the art, and um, and actually the art's quite good. I'm familiar with Greg Capullo's art, um, and I've always I like his work, but uh, I forget who was the artist on these particular ones. But they had um, an insert that was like a mini comic with Frank Miller. I believe it was Frank Miller art, and it was really nice. And so I was like. Uh, I asked the guy if um, if that had come out yet. This uh, mini comic had come out as a full size book because I thought it was just promoting a full size book. And he said, "No, actually, these are just little mini comics that they put in all of those issues." But um, it was there was one in the full size um, Dark Knight Three: The Master Race, which I had seen Jim Lee promoting on Facebook, and I like Jim Lee, um, so he said a full size of this book was in there, and so I thought, okay, well, that makes it worth getting, and so I picked up this, um, I don't know how well you can see the cover, Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, I didn't even realize it was book 5, it was, uh, shrink-wrapped, and it was, um, I believe thirteen, uh, yeah, it's thirteen dollars, twelve ninety nine, which is you know it's a hardcover, it's relatively thin, but um, but you know it seemed like I was in a little bit of a buying frenzy. Um, I'd gotten you know thirty books for thirty bucks, so I went ahead and bought it. Um, I like the cover by Jim Lee, of course, pencil cover, but then I looked inside and. I was not too impressed. Now, there's some decent art in here. Let's see if we can get to it. Getting a little cramped. Um, but I believe the art is by the Cuberts, one of the Cuberts, either Adam or Andy. I guess Adam, or I mean Andy. <laughs> Who would know? Um, it's definitely not Joe Cubert, that's for sure. Uh, let's see, yes, and, oh, it's okay, it's Andy Kubert, and it's inked by Klaus Janssen, you know, classic sort of Frank Miller, um, collaborator, and so this art is perfectly fine, I probably wouldn't have bought the book, you know, I, I may have, I mean, I like the artwork, but, um, it's a relatively slender hardcover, um, $13 is not overly priced, but I expect it also for this full-sized um, mini comic by Frank Miller to be, you know, full size, full pages. And there is, in fact, a comic by Frank Miller, but this is absolutely not the one I saw. 
Um, I don't think the guy was intentionally misleading me by any stretch of the imagination, but I couldn't tell because it was shrink wrapped and I purchased it that way. And when I got it home, I saw this artwork. And this is by Frank Miller and Brian Azzarello. It says art by Frank Miller. Um, and um, it's called Lara. Yeah, Lara number one. And I feel like Frank Miller really just phoned this in. His skills have perhaps deteriorated or swim putting any effort into it. But um, I did not really care for this artwork. It's, it's really sort of clumsy and it just looks like... Uh, it just looks like outlines so, uh, that were then very badly colored. And the colors, I believe, are by Alex Sinclair again, who's a fantastic colorist. But um, I don't know. This looked too much like uh, something that I've seen amateur artists do, you know, for web comics. And I just wasn't impressed at all. And um, it's like, it looks like a zombie. Um, this is, and that looks a little bit more like his Sin City style, which I also don't like. I liked his work on 300. I liked it, obviously, on Daredevil and the original Dark Knight series, but, um, this is not particularly good. So that's not the, that's not the comic that, um, I saw. I saw a much better looking comic. And actually, in retrospect, now I wonder if it was drawn by Frank Miller. I don't think it was. It certainly looked better than that. Um, and as I, I said, the Andy Kubert art and this is perfectly fine, but I probably wouldn't have purchased this book otherwise. However, uh, so <laughs> all of my, uh, dollar fines were kind of negated by spending 13 bucks on a book that I probably really didn't care too much about, but maybe I'll try to read it anyway. Um, but that's kind of what I went through and obviously the big find was, this X Factor that was signed that obviously slipped through. They were putting so many books in those uh, dollar, you know, uh, long box after a long box of dollar comics. So I'm sure they probably missed that signature. I'm sure they didn't mean to put it in there. And I'm pretty happy to actually get that book for a dollar. I enjoyed all of the other books, the artwork, um, Walt Simonson, uh, one Jim Lee book, a couple of Arthur Adams books. Um, Bill Sinkovich. So that's free comic book day for 2017. And this is a pretty long video. I tend to ramble quite a bit. We're closing in on, ooh, almost an hour, 52 minutes. So if anyone, anyone even watched this, um, I hope you enjoyed it. And by all means, like, comment. I would love to hear your comments. Even if you just want to tell me how bad I suck. And, um, subscribe even if you think I suck, and uh, maybe I'll get better. Maybe I'll continue doing videos. So anyway, thanks for watching, and Satanico, goodbye.